Deputy President, Ina Ford and Congress delegates, thank you for this opportunity to present the Rules Review. I have been introduced, for those who don't know me, my name is Cheryl Danson and I'm Chairman of the Rules Advisory Panel. I would like to introduce you to the panel members who have been involved in the review and who will be doing their part of the presentation shortly. We have with us Dawn Jones, previously Chair of MAP, who has continued to represent the, that group in the review. Mandy Nottingham and Lee Gibbs and Yvette Smith, who are RAP panel members. We've also had Jill McIntosh, Chairman of CAP, involved throughout. Unfortunately, Jill can't be with us today. And we've had Vicky Wilson, who is also a member of RAP and again can't be with us today. The Rules Review has been very much a team effort with, with all of the advisory panels involved. Our presentation today will be about one hour and at the end we will invite questions. We will cover the following topics. The review process, I will describe the Rules Review process and timeline. Analysis and summary of feedback, Yvette will provide a summary of the member feedback. The main rules changes, Mandy and Lee will highlight the main rules changes. And the rules book design overview, Dawn will share the concepts behind the rules book design and show some pages from the new rules book. Next steps in implementation, I will share the implementation dates and other tasks that need to be completed. And then we will invite questions. You will already have received the rules text summary, which was distributed to all members and also a summary of the changes, which was issued at the same time by the INF Secretariat. So the review process, in these slides, I will describe the key drivers for the rules review and the process and timeline. So the review process, our starting point was the INF vision, mission and strategic plan. The advisory panels met to discuss our current game and the outcome agreed was the need for change. We worked with the board to propose and agree the overarching guiding principles for the rules review. As any good project manager will know, we then needed a project plan and timeline which included rules trials and development of a communication strategy. The rules text was written and issued to members for feedback and the final draft was distributed a few weeks ago. In parallel to developing the rules text, we started the rules book design, which is now well advanced. <coughs> there are a number of outstanding tasks, including translation of the text into other languages and plans for implementation. So the INF vision, mission and strategic plan I'm sure that all or most of you will have read the INF strategy document. One of the themes of the strategic plan relates to the rules and identifies the need to have effective rules and to ensure that the rules keep pace with the evolving sport of netball. If you remember, we held an interim rules review in 2011, which was presented to Congress, and the full review is being presented to you today. Our game. The outcome of the advisory panel's meeting to discuss the game was communicated to members previously and I want to remind you of the outcome as this set the scene for the work on the rules review that followed. Netball is a unique, exciting and challenging game of fair contest. The simple fact that players operate in confined spaces are challenged on court and fiercely contest makes netball a great game. We also need to acknowledge that disparities across the world in the interpretation of the same set of rules have at times caused confusion. The intent of the game is to score goals in a fair and competitive manner based on skill and within the rules. Ultimately, the game is what is important. So why change the rules? It may be hard to believe, but we don't change the rules for the sake of it or for something to fill our time. The rules review takes considerable time and effort 
and is not an exercise to be embarked on lightly. The rules needed to be reviewed to meet the changing needs of the game and to reflect a modern, forward-looking <coughs> sport. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So guiding principles. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> guiding principles for the rules review. <coughs> Our next task was to define the guiding principles to set the framework for the rules review. These principles were shared with members previously and I will remind you of some of these again. The advisory panels use these principles to guide our work. <coughs> Some of the key phrases are, retain the uniqueness of netball, a forward-looking approach, avoid fussy rules. We want simple, clearly written rules with clarity of interpretation. Simple language which can be easily translated. Reduce the amount of whistle. The amount of whistle has been frequently commented on by spectators, broadcasters, and others involved in the game. A marketable product which is entertaining for the wider public. Consider the welfare and safety of the players. Provide equal opportunities for players irrespective of playing positions. These statements provided the overarching themes for our review. So the rules review timeline, <clears throat> for those of you with very long memories, we started the initial rules review in 2010, five years ago. All members were invited to submit rules proposals and these were reviewed by the advisory panels and used to update the rules text. In addition, five rules changes were proposed to Congress in 2011. Congress agreed three of these changes should be implemented immediately these were the extra time, the visual clock, and stoppages. In addition, Congress agreed that rules trial should be undertaken as part of the full rules review. So in 2013, members were invited to participate in trials and to provide feedback. In 2014, the board agreed the final stage of the process to prepare the rules text. And then in 2015, the rules text was prepared and the rules book designed. So the rules trials, 2013 to 2014, briefs were written for nine trials. These were the two-point scoring system, all injury or illness to be 30 seconds, throw in replaced with a free pass, setting the penalty, taking the centre pass, the application of advantage, control of start of play, division of umpire control, and the centre pass signal. So they were the trials that we wrote the briefs for and invited members to trial them in their countries, see how they worked, and to give feedback. The rules trials process, <clears throat> our 76 full and associate members were invited to take part in the trials. Of these, nine members responded and three members undertook some trials. In parallel, the advisory panels undertook further analysis and a number of rules changes were implemented in Fast Five as the Fast Five game, but also as a trial for the rules review. So what was the outcome of the rules trial? We have used the traffic light system, the, the um, green, red and amber, just to highlight the point. So based on member feedback from the three countries who participated, of the nine rules under uh, trials undertaken, three were rejected, two were recommended for further trials, that is the division of the court and the two-point scoring system, and four were fully accepted. The advisory panels also undertook further analysis of some matches to count the number of whistles and the occasions when the whistle was blown. On average, a goal scored and out of court accounted for over 30% of the whistles blown during a match. Based on these findings, it was agreed that we should reduce the whistle in the game. Good morning, everybody. 
The following rule changes and clarifications are being presented using a variety of formats to best clarify and demonstrate the intent of the new rules. We begin with match duration. The current rules state half time as either five or 10 minutes with this decision being made by the event organizer. The proposed rules have the option for either an eight or 12 minute half time. This change recognizes increased commercial demands within the game, in particular providing greater flexibility in meeting sponsor and broadcast requirements. As with the current rules, the decision on the length of the half time sits with the event organizer. Extra time. In a match where a winner is required and the game is tied at full time, a four minute interval has been introduced at the end of full time. This change standardizes all interval times to four minutes and takes into account both player and umpire welfare, providing sufficient time for hydration and coaching of players before extra time is played. Additionally, the two extra time halves have flexibility of time, that is up to seven minutes to meet the needs of match conditions. The role of the captain. This change recognises the partnership between umpires, players and the captain in managing player behaviour on court. This change formalises the option for the umpire to enlist the assistance of the captain in addressing either a player or player's behaviour which is causing concern. Good morning all. We're playing a tag team presentation here. <clears throat> Currently the rule specifies team officials as coach, manager, captain and up to three personnel, at least one of whom must be a primary care person. This change separates the playing and the non-playing roles and specifies the rule by simply stating a team may have up to five team officials. These will include a coach and at least one primary care. Please note that the primary care must be qualified, must wear an ident identification as specified in the event, by the event, for example an armband, and is permitted on court during stoppages for illness and injury, and that is currently what is applied. However, this rule applies or change provides greater flexibility for the makeup of team officials. Note that we have clarified the primary care may only have that role and no other roles. Scoring a goal. The rationale of this rule change, as was mentioned by Cheryl, is to reduce the amount of whistle in the game. As such, umpire signals a goal has been scored by raising one arm in the air, and that replaces the whistle. Our analysis of the statistics has shown that with this change, along with the change to the thrower not requiring a whistle for out of court unless needed, will reduce the amount of whistle to approximately 30%. Now we'd like to just show you what that look, will look like visually. The umpires signal a goal has been scored by raising one arm vertically and immediately indicate the direction of the next centre pass. We move on now to the conditions for the penalty pass. The rationale of this rule change was driven by member feedback and included significant input from the coaching advisory panel CAP. During this review process, three member countries, England, Jamaica and New Zealand, 
trialled this rule change on performance level gains and provided positive feedback. The rule change is, when the umpire awards a penalty, the infringer must stand out of play. This means the infringer must move quickly to the position indicated, stand beside and away from the player taking the penalty pass, so as not to impede that player. And finally, to remain in this position and not move or take any part in play until the ball has been released. Once a player is in position to take a penalty pass, that player may choose either to play the ball immediately or to wait for the infringer to stand out of play. The following video clips demonstrate both options available to the player taking the penalty pass. Once the player taking a penalty pass is in the correct position, the player may choose either to play the ball immediately or to wait for the infringer to stand out of play. If the player chooses to play the ball immediately, the infringer may not take part in play until the ball has been released or make any attempt to intercept the penalty pass. The penalty pass will be retaken if the infringer interferes with it. We now move on to the centre pass. So why change the centre pass rule? The change to the centre pass rule was driven by the desire to speed up the game and to remove the pedantic nature of the current rule, which is often poorly ruled. The new rule states, to start play, the centre is required to have only one foot wholly inside the centre circle. The different scenarios demonstrate that I'm about to put on screen will demonstrate both the correct and incorrect foot positioning. The first one is two, foot, two feet wholly within the centre circle, which is correct. The second one is one foot wholly inside the centre circle and one foot outside, again correct. Thirdly, one foot wholly inside the centre circle and one foot on the line, again correct. And then we move to two incorrect demonstrations. The first is two feet on the centre circle line, which is incorrect. And two feet outside the centre circle, which again is incorrect. In addition to these, the centre may stand on one foot wholly within the centre circle, but they must be on that one foot wholly within the centre circle. We're going to look at the throw-in, <clears throat> and this is no change, but more around a clarification. The current rule book states the throw-in is to be taken immediately behind the line, which can create some confusion with regard to the interpretation of immediately behind. The new wording provides clarity by stating a distance of 15 centimetres or 6 inches behind the line. It should be noted there is no intended difference between the application of the current rule and the new throw-in rule. Let's have a look, see what that looks like visually. The player taking the throw-in stands outside the court with at least one foot within 15 centimetres, that's six inches of the line at the point indicated by the umpire. Next um, change is around illness, <coughs> injury or blood. The rationale behind this change was to remove the tactical team stoppages, or what our media will call tactical timeouts on television, and to keep the game moving. Again, CAP provided considerable input into the discussions and subsequent development of this rule change. The umpire holds time for injury, illness or blood upon appeal from an on-court player. The umpire will hold time for blood when noticed, 
that is, the umpire may hold time without a request being made. The player concerned must leave, the, must leave within 30 seconds and, and receive any treatment off court. In the event of the primary care person advising the umpire that the player concerned cannot be removed safely within 30 seconds, the umpires will extend the time for the player to leave the court. Now we move to the pivot. The rationale is to provide greater clarity of the pivot. The pivot is specified under definitions at the front of the rule book. That is, a pivot is a movement where a player with the ball swivels on either the heel or the ball of the landing foot without gaining any ground. Both correct and incorrect pivots are demonstrated in the following. Correct pivot is where the player with the ball swivels on either the heel or the ball of the landing foot without gaining any ground. The incorrect pivot is where the player with the ball swivels on either the heel or the ball of the landing foot gaining ground. And this final clip here is again demonstrating the correct pivot. <coughs> Requirements for taking a shot. The purpose of this rule change was driven from the increasing innovations being seen from defending players primarily at the shot. For example, the lifting of one player by another to reject the shot at goal. As caretakers of the rules, it is important we ensure we retain a fair contest for all players. As such, the new rule change now includes a defending player may not deflect the ball on its downward flight towards the ring, including touching the ball up through the net. We will now demonstrate this on another video. A defending player may deflect the ball on its upward flight towards the ring. But a defending player may not deflect a ball on its downward flight towards the ring. They must have jumped pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> We're moving now into game management. And the rationale for change here from the current discipline section of the news, new rules book text with a game management section is to... Let's see. Oop. Oh, sorry, I've jumped ahead a little bit early. <laughs> Firstly, the reasons behind this change. Provide a more clearly graded structure for umpires in managing the game. Give increased clarity for, to players and coaches. Provide greater consistency between umpires. And importantly, to pro provide support for the umpires to work together. The rules remain unchanged with regard to player responsibility. That is, it is the player's responsibility to ensure they comply with the rules and participa participate safely in a sporting and fair manner. In addition to the normal sanctions, the umpires may use any of the following. Caution a player. A player is advised the player specified must change. Issue an official warning. The player is warned that a suspension will follow if the behaviour specified continues. Suspend a player, now specifying the length of time for the suspension as two minutes. This was after a lot of um, discussion and input and agreement from CAP. And finally, the most severe of all sanctions is ordering off, ordering a player off. 
Just to reiterate, the rules remain unchanged with regard to player responsibilities. That is, it is a player's responsibility to ensure they comply with the rules and participate safely in a sporting and fair manner. It is the umpire's responsibility to control a match accordingly to, according to the rules. They apply the rules of the game fairly, communicate clearly, maintain a calm and decisive control. So now, looking again to the future. As part of our work, we looked at the rules of several other sports. Although not an exhaustive list, this gave a very good spread across most popular sports. And you see the sports that we consulted against here. We were particularly interested in the layout and presentation of their rules rather than the content, which is, of course, often in dispute within particular sports. Some provided us with a good idea of what not to do, but a small number provided a very good basis for us to draw up a rule book that was more modern in its presentation. We set some guidelines for the new rule book. Namely, it should be written in what we called simple English. So it was easily understood and would also be easy to translate. It should avoid repetition unless that was really needed for clarity. The layout should be fresh and modern. We felt it should be available not only in print and on the internet, but also as an app. We employed an English language specialist to provide guidelines for language and syntax, and her guidance proved invaluable. She also had some experience of technical writing, which was particularly useful. Oops, we've gone too far. So what are the features of the new rule book that may look different from the rule books that you're used to? From our research and the guidelines we set, you will find the following. A definition section at the front which provides easy reference and avoids terminology being described each time a term is used. Court areas have been defined, accompanied by illustrations. Terminology commonly used in other sports has been used, such as sanction and foul play. More detailed game management structure has been outlined, and that's been mentioned earlier. The use of colour and a font style that would be easy to read have been considered. The order of sections was rethought and arranged in what we felt was a logical order. We felt it should be easy to find any desired rule without a number of references being included. The hand signal diagrams were made consistent in style. The panel has worked with Nikki Richardson from INF and a design firm to produce the actual rule book. If you decide to adopt the draft rules today, including the amendments, only a small number of minor changes will be needed and a fine proofread, final proofread before the rules are ready for distribution. So here are some samples of pages from the new rule book. The cover page looks a little different probably from the cover pages you've seen. Here's part of the definitions. The layout is there simply for you to see what it looks like. The court diagrams. And goalposts and ball obviously. Sections with match length. Not quite sure the colours are quite right yet for easy reading, but that's one of the minor tweaks needed. Hand signals. And the back cover. So that's just a foretaste 
of what the new rule book will look like, it is almost ready to go if the decision is made to proceed. And I'll now hand over to Cheryl, who will draw our presentation to a conclusion. So the next steps and implementation. The rules text has been distributed, but we still have further tasks to deliver. The rules book is well advanced, as described by Dawn. We are currently preparing some frequently asked questions and answers, and some of those have come from the analysis of member feedback, so we've started to compile responses to those questions ready for publication. The rules text will require translating into other languages, for example, Spanish, French, traditional Chinese, and Hebrew, and we will be looking for our members to help us with the translation because I don't speak those languages. Um, some matters will be referred to the board for decision. For example, the registration of team uniforms. So there are a number of things that came out of the feedback, a number of questions, and in the responses back to the members, I said this will be referred to the INF board and these, they will be passed over to them. Um, the protocols are being updated and will be published. The bench officials manual will need to, be, need to be reviewed and updated. And finally, implementation for international competition. This will be from the 1st of January 2016. And for domestic competition, i.e. back in your own country, you decide when you implement the new rules, but it must be no later than September 2016. So by September 2016, globally, we would be playing to the same set of rules. That concludes our presentation. Thank you all to our presenters and to all of you for listening. And I'll now hand back to Kate. <laughs>